in the church records. Church records are often the most complete early evidence that you'll find for Irish family history. In Ireland, they often start before formal state records. Civil registration only starts in 1864. The first complete surviving census of Ireland we have is 1901. Tonight, we're going to ask what records were made, what survives and where to find them. And we're going to ask what evidence do church records have at any moment in time? And what can this tell us about a rapidly changing Irish society? Historically, the Catholic Church and the Church of Ireland were separate faith communities. The two churches were broadly similar in terms of the hierarchy of their clergy, their structure, parishes and diocese, and their liturgy, the customary public worship. Now that's a bold thing to say in the context of Irish society, where we often still perceive religion as being the great divider. So let's examine each of these statements to see if they actually hold water. Do they stand up? Well, the basic hierarchy of both churches was laid down in medieval times. In 1536, an act of the Irish Parliament established the Reformed Church of Ireland as the state church. The act replaced the Pope with the sovereign as the head of the church. And this continued until 1871 and disestablishment. The 1869 Irish Church Act removed the sovereign as the head of the Irish church, the Church of Ireland, and separated out the functions of the church and state amongst other things. Both these churches were organized, are organized by parishes grouped in dioceses. Church of Ireland parishes broadly corresponded to the pre-Reformation parishes. Between 1824 and 1837, the Ordnance Survey defined and mapped the boundaries of Church of Ireland parishes to establish civil parishes. Now, after 1837, as the Anglican community in Ireland declined the boundaries of civil and Church of Ireland parishes began to diverge. The Anglican faith community responded by organizing parishes in unions for public worship. And as the community continued to contract, Church of Ireland diocese were merged. Demographics were on the side of the Catholic Church. Throughout the 19th and into the early 20th century, its population continued to expand. After emancipation, the Catholic hierarchy began for the first time in over 300 years to reform the Irish Church. They wanted to bring it into line with the Church in Europe. And they had to take into account the huge population growth from about 2 million in 1700 to eight and a half million by the 1840s. Now, after emancipation, so from 1830 onwards, parish priests were appointed, often for the first time. Older parishes were carved up into two or three or more parishes. And it's no accident that over half of all surviving Catholic parish registers date from after 1830. Now, as family historians, we have inherited this problem of changing parish boundaries. And anticipating being asked a question about how do we actually trace these boundaries, all I can say is um, with a lot of hard work. This is one of those things that really are no shortcuts to. A lot of map work, although there are some good websites available now too. And the last similarity I want to look at before we begin digging into the original records are, is the liturgy. 
The Catholic and the Church of Ireland both recognize seven sacraments. Baptism, confirmation, communion, reconciliation, holy matrimony, ordination, and last rites. Now, as family historians, we're probably most familiar with baptismal and marriage registers. As researchers, we are usually working with incomplete evidence. In 1922, about two thirds of all the historic records of the Church of Ireland were destroyed when the Public Records Office of Ireland went up in flames. And the only Catholic records that we can access are the conservation copy of Catholic registers made between 1950 and the 1970s by the National Library. Now, even so, what evidence is available to us tells us that both churches made records of other sacraments. Search, and you will find lists of confirmations for both churches, communicants in the vestry records, and last rites in the burial books. Records for these other sacraments can be found for the Catholic Church, church um, grouped as Catholic congregational records if you're searching on the Find My Pass website. And I mention FMP because it's the one that I'm most familiar with. It's the one that I use all the time. In fact, the only sacramental records that we shouldn't, that you should never find a record of, are of reconciliation. Okay, now we're going to start digging into the records to see what we can see. Um, and I want to share with you some fun and interesting records that I have found um, in the last 10 years or more. We we'll start looking at baptismal records. The purpose of baptism, of course, was to welcome the child into the faith community. And the minimum information you'll find in a baptismal record is the date of baptism, the name of the child baptized, and the names of the godparents. Some early registers don't include the mother's maiden name. Infants born in Catholic families were baptized very soon after birth. And this was because the church continued to promulgate the teaching of limbo. Limbo was first established in 418 in the Synod of Carthage. So it really is quite an ancient custom. And in fact, I think the teaching of limbo was only actually abolished by the last Pope, by Benedict. Um, I'm not sure, was he Benedict the 13th? We'll come back to that. The Church of Ireland rejected this teaching at the time of the Reformation. And so families of this faith community tend to allow a longer time period between the birth and the baptism of their infant children. You will sometimes see as well Church of Ireland families putting up two or three children at a time, saving them up as a job lot, and you have um, two or more children on the altar of varying ages. We sometimes find evidence in both churches of other earlier faith traditions around baptism that survived. In Ireland and Britain, there was a very ancient custom. A sickly child might be baptized a second time to try and bring them on. Now, the difficulty we have in Irish research is that we tend to get the same family names in regional clusters, and families tend to use a narrow range of saints' names for children, as well as founders' names, so you can get names recurring within, within branches of an extended family. So we find the same names appearing all the time in the registers. Now in 26 years, I've only found indisputable evidence in three cases, two of them in the Church of Ireland. And this is a fourth potential case study, which I've included here because it's for Claire. And I'm under very strict instructions from Jane to try and bring in as many Claire examples as I possibly can. Now, this was found in the Catholic parish register of Newmarket and Fergus for 1851. This is not clear cut. 
there's nine months between the two baptisms and conceivably Biddy Lynch could have fallen pregnant immediately after the birth of the first child of that name, the first female infant of that name in February. But I met this lady's grandson and he remembered his grandmother as a child. He accepted this as fact and he told me that she was actually known in her community as a wise woman. So make of that what you will. I do have other examples which are much more clearly, much more clear cut, where the time frame between the first and second baptism is four or five months. Now here's evidence of some other older customs which are more commonly found in baptismal registers. In Catholic and Church of Ireland parishes, you'll sometimes find three godparents, two of the same gender as the child being baptized. And my husband assures me that this tradition survives down to the present day in posh Church of Ireland families. We also sometimes find godparents described as gossips. Now this doesn't mean that they were tattletales. Gossip is a much older term. It's derived from God Sib. The idea being that the ritual of standing as a godparent established a kin relationship between the godchild and their sponsor. So it's another kind of, it's a spiritual, a family relationship established by the spiritual, by the ritual. Now, once a woman had given birth, she was confined for up to a month. And this was her green month when she wasn't expected to carry out her usual domestic duties or engage, um, including her conjugal duties. At the end of that month, the woman was churched. Churching was a rite of purification and thanksgiving for the safe delivery of a woman after the birth of her child. The woman would go into the church. I think that from the evidence I can find, the ritual of churching usually happened close to the baptismal font. She would give the officiating priest accustomed offerings. And by the 1830s, that was usually defined as two and sixpence. And the priest would present her to the whole congregation. Now I have two examples here on screen from County Mayo and County Galway. Uh, these both took place in Catholic churches. But it should be noted that churching was a very ancient custom practiced by the Catholic but also the Church of Ireland. All of Queen Victoria's children, once Queen Victoria delivered all of her children, Queen Victoria was churched after um, giving birth to each of her children. So it's a custom that continued in the Church of Ireland. And it only seems to have been eventually phased out at the end of Victoria's reign um, in the early 20th century. But in the Catholic Church, it actually continued into the 1960s. And I've actually met people who say they can remember standing as small children beside their mother or an aunt and watching the entire small ceremony taking place. Now, where records of churching survive in the Catholic Church, parish re registers. It's usually as a note in the baptismal register. In the Church of Ireland records, I have found some lists, separate lists of women being churched. Now, the only way I can explain this is that as the established church, Church of Ireland clergymen had a greater budget, a greater stationary budget, and they also probably had more time on their hands with smaller congregations. So they seem to have actually grouped together the names of women churched, names and dates. And we have here an example, part of the Folliot collection, Rosemary Folliot's collection, which is online.
Now, both the Catholic and the Church of Ireland agreed on what made for a lawful marriage. The bride and groom had to give their free consent. There should be no impediments to the marriage. The marrying pair had to give advance notice. Marriages were celebrated by an ordained clergyman in front of witnesses during canonical hours. And a permanent record had to be kept. Finally, the marriage had to be consummated. And if any of these factors was missing, an argument could be made that the marriage was invalid and it could be set aside. Now the question of what made a lawful marriage was always important because it determined inheritance and succession. And these issues were every bit as important to tenant farmers holding their land by a lease as, it was, as they were to landed families where there was a lot of land, a lot of money and resources at stake. We find a huge amount of evidence in church registers about marriage traditions in Ireland. In penal times, the Catholic Church didn't have priests in every parish, or didn't even always have a church to worship in. So many couples entered into irregular marriages, common law marriages, that weren't blessed by a priest. Now these were permanent relationships. They were accepted by their family and their community. The only thing missing was that it had, had not been a priest, they hadn't put themselves, presented themselves before a priest to bless the union. Even in parishes that had a priest, couples usually married in their own homes or in their place of work. Brides usually married in their own home parish. And we begin to see this being pushed out by the early 1800s as more young women go into service and they marry close to their place of work. Marriages were seasonal. Matches were usually made at the start of the harvest in the Lunasa hiring fairs. There were no long engagements. Couples would usually marry in the interval from the end of the agricultural season, late October and November, carrying through to the start of Lent in February or March, depending on when Easter fell in any given year. If we look at the evidence of marriage and baptismal registers, it's evident that premarital sexual activity was common. You can compare the evidence of the marriage and the baptismal registers. And it's remarkable how many brides were heavily pregnant and six, seven, eight, even nine months pregnant when they stood before the priest at the altar. In the 18th century, the Catholic Church began to encourage greater conformity to the liturgy, especially marriage. If you look on screen, I have two examples taken from the Catholic parish of Delvin in the 1780s in West Mead. Notice the unusual language in these registers. The bride and groom are renewing their consent. Instead of the usual two witnesses, the best man and the bridesmaid, the witnesses are the whole congregation. Now, if this all sounds very Kanye West and Kim Kardashian to you, um, start thinking, what actually is at stake with regard to these, um, what's taking place here on the altar? The priest is performing these marriages retrospectively, and he's doing this to bring the couples into the Catholic liturgy. And he's doing this publicly before the whole congregation, the entire faith community. Between 1785 and 1789, so five years, I looked at the records in Delvin over five years, and I noted that 6% of all marriages in that parish were to regularize irregular unions. Now, I mentioned impediments to marriage. In Ireland, the most common impediments, the most common impediment was consanguinity, blood relationship. And the second was affinity. 
This was marriages between in-laws or step-siblings, which were forbidden. A man wasn't supposed to marry his late wife's sister or his brother's widow or his godparent's daughter. Do you remember we mentioned the god sibling, the fact that somebody stood as a godparent created a spiritual affinity. But many Irish couples wanted to marry for love or perhaps for inheritance to try and keep land within the family. The Catholic Church developed a system of marriage dispensations to accommodate this. For a small fee, the impediment to the marriage could be set aside and a record was made in the parish registers. If you look at these two examples on screen, we find Martin Walsh and Maria Regan related in the fourth degree. And of course you calculate degrees from the number of generations from the marrying pair to a common ancestor. So a fourth degree would indicate second cousins. Below that, we have Thomas Higgins and Catherine Frame related in the third degree, first cousins. In the Catholic Church, the only blood relationship, the only um, cousin relationship that was um, consistently ruled against was double first cousins. Now we mentioned that church records, church registers were sacramental records. But in fact, some priests kept them as a financial record of their earnings. In this example on screen, Mononahoam, County Tipperary, the parish priest kept a detailed record of the fees paid by each couple as he married them. The higher the fee paid, the greater the amount of evidence documented in the register. Additional evidence might include the couple's townland addresses, the husband's occupation, and the names of the bride and groom's respective fathers. The lowest fees paid were paid by couples who married as part of the group. That is where several couples went up together on the altar at the same time to be married. Group marriages in Mullen home in the 18 teens and 20s were a common, a regular occurrence. Unfortunately, in the group marriages, the priest only appears to have documented the names of the grooms. So if you want to actually find the names of the brides, you have to go and look at the baptismal registers if the couple remained within the parish. This of course means that you actually lose the name of the bride as and where couples migrated back to the groom's usual place of residence or if they emigrated, um, if they left the, left the county or even um, left the country. Now in the Church of Ireland, you will sometimes see couples recorded in the register as paupers, but you never find more than one couple on the altar at any one time. Here's what I believe is another instance of the priest keeping the marriage register more as a financial record than anything else. You'll note that he made some rather choice comments about, about the brides. He refers to the infamous Catherine Dolly, who married James Dillon of Athen Rye, and Biddy, Biddy Cox, who he refers to as that pickpocket married the unfortunate farmer, Michael McDonough. Now, if you look closely at the register, you'll notice that Biddy and Michael paid the priest no fee. And it is possible, and I think likely, that this, in fact, may have clouded his judgment when he recorded these comments. The Church of Ireland was responsible for burying the dead of all the community. Some parishes like St. James's in Dublin kept a record of everyone they buried. Unfortunately, the greater number of Church of Ireland parishes recorded only their own faith community. 
So even if you know where an ancestor or um, a relative was buried, there may not be a contemporary record that survives. A minority of Catholic par parishes always kept registers of deaths and burials. I think Longford is actually the outlier from about the 1820s onwards and continuing through to the 1850s, I believe every Catholic parish in Longford began to keep a burial register. And in a way, it actually is a mark of the growing confidence immediately before and after emancipation. In Ireland, the earliest and the most enduring tradition around burial was to bury the dead on home ground alongside their own kindred. Burial and consecrated ground was reserved for those who were baptized. Infants that were miscarried or stillborn were not supposed to be buried in a graveyard on consecrated ground. Their families very often skirted around this by burying unbaptized children in Killeens. These were usually older graveyards in the community. So it satisfied those two key things that it was consecrated ground, even if it was closed to the current community and that the children were probably going to be buried alongside an earlier generation of their family. Now, the tradition of burying people alongside their own kind could survive for generations, even after a family moved out of the district. In one case study, I traced a family in Wexford who in 1694 moved from Clonmore near Enniscorthy to Ballymore near Ferns. It's a distance of 30 kilometers. And I found that for the next four generations, until the 1820s, this family continued to bring their dead home for burial. So they brought their, their dead south, brought them home to Clonmore to bury them. In another case study, I found that in 1791, Mr. John Kearney died suddenly while he was on business in Dublin. The evidence in the Shinrone Church of Ireland burial register recorded that he was brought home for burial, a distance of over 130 kilometers. So that was quite a way to go. And in a way it tells us how important it was to be buried with your own people. By 1800, the St. Kearney family settled 15 kilometers south of Shinrone in Moneygall. And between 1800 and 1851, so for almost two generations, they continued to bring their dead home for burial to Shinron. The tradition only ended after 1851 when the family emigrated to the US. Now the evidence in burial registers is very limited. The minimum information we have are the name of the deceased, the date of death, and sometimes of burial. But some registers would include more evidence than this. This page on screen is from the burial register of St. Warburg's, Dublin City in 1745. Now on it we find the name of the dead, their age at time of death, the date of burial, their street address, their occupations, in some instances we find, particularly where it's children, family relationships, and occasionally the cause of death. Looking across this page, some of the causes of death we find include cancer, asthma, smallpox, decay, consumption, and a fractured skull. And um, wasting disease is usually used to describe anything from cancer to tuberculosis, any disease for the person and may have lost weight as they became more ill. Where we find the cause of death recorded in a burial register, we can sometimes find evidence of epidemics sweeping through a community. 
Church records sometimes include a shocking number of infant deaths from simple diseases like measles and mumps. On screen is a page from the Nauber Catholic Register. In early summer 1858, scarlet fever appears to have swept through this country parish. If you look to the page, look for a little X and a scarlet Tina, and you'll notice the many deaths that occurred in the space of nine weeks. In Irish society, women continue to be known all their lives by their maiden names. And before 1864, we can analyze the internal evidence of baptismal and marriage registers to see if women are recorded by their maiden names when they stand as godparents in the baptismal registers. After 1864, we can actually compare the civil and church registers. But we also find evidence of this practice in other church records. If you look at this example on screen, again, we're returning to Delvin in West Meath. And we find that the Delvin burial registers identified women by their married and their maiden names. It also rather kindly gives us the townland address so that it's actually possible to identify these women, to pick one Mary Brown out from another. Now, we've looked mainly at records in and around the sacraments and the key life events. But both churches also kept their own administrative records. In Ireland, the Catholic Church was a private institution. It had pastoral duties for its community. We often find administrative records like Christmas and Easter Jews, donations to the parish, or um, money spent on building work. Again, if you look at the Catholic congregational records, I found a fairly wide range of administrative records uh, recorded there. One Catholic priest listed parishioners that received food during the famine. But I've also found more than 12 examples of parish census recorded by the parish priest. And not all of these are from the 1830s and 40s when Daniel O'Connell actually requested priests to carry out these kind of parish census. Look at this example on screen. This is from Kilfenora Parish in Clare. The priest used a H to denote the husband and a W to show the wife. Interesting to see that the husband and the children were recorded by their family name, but the wife continued to be called by, to be identified by her maiden name. Now, this is a particularly useful parish uh, completed in the 1860s, so about 20 years after the famine. And the priest also stated where parishioners had, where they were gone. In some instances, if they died, we also find evidence of families that have gone to Australia or who are now in Boston. We mentioned previously that between 1536 and 1871, the Church of Ireland was the state church. It was an arm of the government. Its parishes were administrative units. Its courts had matrimonial and testamentary jurisdiction. If you wanted to prove a will or to take out a grant of administration, or in fact do anything that required a solemn oath, you had to go before the church courts. Its clergy and parish officers carried out local government duties, policing until 1816. The first census enumerators in 1821 and 1831 were um, about half of them included the church, the parish wardens from the Church of Ireland. The Church of Ireland carried out it had a social welfare function until 1839. And for most of the 19th century, Church of Ireland parishes provided utilities, street cleaning, lighting, mending roads, 
and the revenue collection to pay for it all. Now there's a very good survival of local government records in Church of Ireland vestry records. And these are deposited in two main repositories, the RCBL in Dublin and PRONI, the Public Records Office in Belfast. Some of the records you can commonly find in the vestry include rents for church pews, a list of the parish poor and outdoor relief, assistance for people who remained in their own homes. You'll find things like subscriptions or donations, sometimes where parishioners had experienced a setback, a house fire, or a serious illness of the breadwinner, or even death. We find church wardens accounts, the army wives lottery for enlisted men and their families. It always took place in the Church of Ireland vestry. We find parish watchmen's accounts and arrangements to collect the parish says. I've used these records with great results. Um, one example, um, let me show you one example. The important thing to remember is that vestry records document not only the faith community, but also people of other faith groups within the community. Here's an example from a real life case. In 2016, the Family History Center was commissioned by the White House to research Joe Biden's family ahead of his visit to Ireland with his own extended family, his own siblings, his daughter and his mm -hmm. grandchildren. Now we found this letter dated 1845 and signed by Joe Biden's great, great, great grandfather, Catholic Edward Blewett of Ballina, County Mayo. <clears throat> the parish vestry had employed Blewett to measure the property boundaries for the cess. And Blewett just wrote directly to Dublin Castle looking for confirmation just to make sure that he actually had clear instructions of exactly what it was he was required to do. Oh dear, this is boring. <clears throat> okay, I think that's enough church records. I'm going to finish there. I want to finish with a couple of last thoughts. Church records are manuscripts, and they are only as good as the person that made them. Remember, even ordained clergy had feet of clay. If you look at this example from the Kenmare Catholic Register, the parish priest noted that he accidentally burned the register from 1847 and 1848 before he could transcribe them into the main body of the parish register. So that's two years of records for Kinmare that are permanently lost. Manuscripts are also original, unique records. You don't know what it is you're going to find until you have the manuscript open on your desk. And here's something unexpected I found in the Catholic parish register in Nobber in County Meath. This is an eyewitness account of a local accident that happened in summer 1767. A local farmer, Halpenny, tried to sink a well shaft on his land. Three men from the district died horribly, a protracted, agonizing death. The parish priest saw it all. He found it so grotesque that when he returned home, he sat down in the study and he wrote out a detailed account over four or five pages in the parish register. Now, to the best of my knowledge, no other record survives of this incident. This is the only record that survives to tell us that this ever happened. So always allow for surprises, not always pleasant ones. But just remember, until you actually have the records open on the desk in front of you, you don't know what it is you are going to find in the records. I want to finish with one last thought. 
Irish church records reflect the society that they served and they tell us about religious identity in the past. They have rich pickings for Irish family historians who are willing to drill down into the records. And I hope that this talk has gone some way to encourage you all to do just that. I'm gonna stop talking because my voice is getting gravelly. Um, Thank you so much, Fiona. Uh, I, 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 almost for me, it's hard to know where to start. Uh, like most people, I've ventured into church records, but probably nothing in the depth you have demonstrated what's available. Would I be correct in saying that, that most of the detail you refer to resides in the Church of Ireland as opposed to the Roman Catholic records? No, Larry, some of my best examples actually come from the Catholic parish registers. Okay. Um, and that's and corrected. Not, sorry, that's not just because the Catholic uh, faith community was a much larger one than the Church of Ireland. There's a better survival of the records. Um, the records don't start, they don't have as early a start date. That's the one thing. But the records reflect the community that attends them. They reflect the community and they reflect what's going on in the districts. So they really are a fabulous source. Um, and I really would say to everyone, no, it's not just C of I. There's a wealth of records there for the Catholic Church. Excellent, excellent. I certainly am going to review this video, the recording, once I get it uh, edited and up on, the, uh, on our website. But thank you so much for such an informative and uh, interesting talk. I have a number of questions here. Would you take them, Fiona? Yes, of course. Uh, firstly, I just mentioned quickly that we have folks here from Trim, uh, Florida, Dublin, of course, uh, our own Ennis, and Derry. And uh, we have Betty's Town, County Meath. Rath Farnham, St. Albans, UK, Galway, and Quern. I could probably go on and on, Craig well, but I'll try to get to the questions. Uh, my first question is, well, by the way, first of all, uh, we have a very good attendance tonight, probably one of the best we've had there's, I think, registered at one time 47, and we have 43 on board. So well done, everyone. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, there's Patty Waldron made a comment. Uh, Pope Benedict the 15th died 100 years ago this week, in fact. The third. Right? Is it 23rd? 15th, I think. Am I wrong, Patty? No, you're correct, Larry. Pope Benedict the Sixteenth then is the emeritus pope who buried limbo. Or there's some very interesting headlines if you Google exactly what he did to it. Sixteenth, sixteenth okay. is the current man, the, the emeritus man. Fifteenth. I, I actually thought sixteen had died this week because I looked up at the television screen and a piece about the handover of Dublin Castle a hundred years ago, and it said Pope Benedict died. And I didn't realize I was looking at a hundred year old news. Uh, Aileen Wynn has asked an interesting question. Uh, what was churching a Catholic only or also a Church of Ireland thing too? No, Aileen, this is extraordinary. Churching is Church of Ireland and Catholic. Every single one, every one of Queen Victoria's many children, once she delivered them, she actually presented herself to be churched. It was phased out I think pretty much at the end of Victoria's reign, you couldn't very well phase it out when the monarch herself um, followed through on that social custom. But it, I know it continues into the 1960s. I don't think it actually survives Vatican II in the Catholic Church. Um, I was talking to Clodagh Tate in uh, Mary I. She, I was talk talking to her about churching. She has a... Uh, she has a new graduate student who's coming in to do, and she wants to actually focus on churching in the 20th century. So I was able to tell her a little bit about the long history 
I only looked at it from the 16th century to the 20th. But how many customs do you know that you can actually document and that you can trace for over 500 years continuity? Excellent. Can you unmute? Yep. Uh, I have a, a, a humorous one, I think. Okay, from Michael Connell. I got a chuckle out of it anyway. Uh, a West Cork marriage proposal from a shy man would sound something like, how would you like to be buried with my people? <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard that one. Um, what can I say to that? Um, not a thing, not a thing. Just enjoy the humor of it, right? And that, and that came from uh, the stories of Eamon Kelly. Some of the older people there will remember Eamon Kelly. He was a, a great storyteller, you know, and uh, he, he was more or less referring to the, he said the Kerry men had a more subtle way of doing it, you know. Um, Michael, I have heard the same thing from a couple that you and I know living no more than about three miles from you. It was a West Clare uh, thing as well. Oh, I know it was, I know it was, but to, well, we had to throw it over on the cock folk, you know. Uh, Michael Alco also says that the Kerry men were known to be more subtle than the Cork men. <laughs> Do we have anybody agreeing to that? I don't think we have any Cork or Kerry on. <laughs> uh, we have one here from uh, Eamon, Eamon Healy. Eamon, good evening and welcome. Uh, hi, Fiona. Fantastic talk. Thank you. I often hear people say less than 5% of Catholic records nationwide nationwide began before 1830 and wondering if that's true in your opinion. I know some larger cities began much earlier, but what is covered like pre-1830 for Ireland as a whole from your experience? Eamon, coverage isn't great before 1830, but it is higher than 5%. Um, I actually saw, I know that I, I know that I talked with, um, I talked with Aoife O'Connor and Find My Past when they were digitizing, when they were indexing the records, the Catholic Parish Register Collection. And she gave me figures for, she broke it down into three different cohorts, 1800 to 1830, after 1830, and then before 1800. And I think I remember that the, Records that survived before 1800 were at least 5% of the coverage. So it's not even cities. If you look at, I think it's Killinall um, in County Tipperary, that is very early records from the 18, from the 1740s. And um, there's a few outliers like that. The problem is that the penal laws discouraged the form of the Catholic church throughout the 1700s, but they also dissuaded the priests from keeping registers. Now, all of that said, I think there's a very, very strong argument for a new conservation project. The conservation project of parish registers, of Catholic parish registers that was carried out between the 1950s and 70s, focused only on marriage and baptismal records. But we know from the congregational records that many priests had other records beyond those two categories. So there's a very strong argument to be made for a new conservation project to take place, to go out into the districts and to capture not only Catholic parish registers, but the registers of other denominations. Remember Protestant churches were a much um, greater part, the Protestant population was much greater in the 1700s and 1800s than it, subsequently, um, than it subsequently fell to. But we should look to digitize records, not simply baptism and marriage registers, but the other sacramental records and administrative records. And it's quite important we do it now because if you're talking about registers being kept from around the time that emancipation is granted, then most of these registers, most of these records will be 200 years old. And Irish paper doesn't survive well in the, paper doesn't survive well in the Irish climate. So we either conserve now or we lose them permanently. Eamon, do you have a further question? 
No, I think Fiona covered that fairly succinctly. Thanks so much. That was some fantastic information there. Okay, excellent. Uh, a question from Jer Harnett. What is the best place to get Catholic church records? Online on Ancestry of Find My Past. Um, I have to say that as a professional genealogist, I use all the subscription websites. It's kind of horses for courses. I tend to look at Find My Past when I'm looking at records of people in Ireland. But when it comes to a source like the Catholic parish registers, I move between Ancestry, FMP and Roots Ireland. Roots Ireland transcribed from the original registers and you often also have local knowledge. There's also a small number of parishes in counties like Loud and especially in Clare that aren't part of the Catholic parish register collection. And so you'll only actually find them in Roots Ireland. There are many comments, uh, Fiona, really. People really, really pleased with, with the talk. Uh, Aileen, excellent talk, many thanks. Uh, great point, I should look at the pages of the parish registers more than I do. Uh, you have given some excellent examples. Uh, fantastic talk from Jane. Uh, the parish registers often contain so much interesting information. Thanks so much for your expertise. Uh, we have a thank you from Canada. Uh, uh, Guramagath from Michael O'Connor, I think. Connell. Uh, excellent talk from Doran in South Carolina. Uh, many thanks from Paul. Uh, is there a central database where you can access Catholic church records or do you have to go to the individual church record? The easiest thing to do is to actually search online on Ancestry, Find My Past, or Roots Ireland. Don't just look for the, don't just look for a, a specific baptismal record. And um, if you can't find that particular child, look for any other baptismal records of children born to the same parents. Ireland isn't America, so what's the chances of finding two couples of the same name flourishing in a region at the same time? Yes, yeah. Uh, more thanks from Marion. Uh, really interesting talk. Uh, great load of information. Uh, Niall Matthews. Uh, Vestry records are in P R O N I, or or where else? Question mark. Uh, Prony and in the R C B L. Uh, the representative church body library. It is in Churchtown, Bremer Park in Churchtown, Dublin fourteen. It's on a main bus route. So you'll actually hop on a bus in the city center. You'll be out there in 20 minutes. Okay. And another one, is it correct, Coleman? Is it correct to say that the records pre-1830s are more likely to be found in Church of Ireland records? And can you repeat source of ladder? Um, is it correct so that records before 1830 are more likely found in Church of Ireland records? Um, that's kind of like apples and oranges. Originally, there would have been more Church of Ireland parish registers dating from before 1830. But after disestablishment in 1876, an act of parliament declared the historic records of the Church of Ireland as public records. So they were systematically gathered for almost the next 15 years into the Public Records Office. And by 1922, two thirds of all historic records were deposited there and they went up in smoke. Wow. You can trace almost every Irish family back to the 1830s. And before that, it's kind of an accident of history. So when I'm looking at any Irish family before 1830, I tend to look at all records that survive in a district. I will, of course, focus on church records for the particular um, uh, church records of the faith community the person I'm interested in belong to, but I will look at other records like the vestry records, okay. um, especially because they've got a local government function. Uh, Marie is thanking you also for an excellent talk. And Aileen has passed a comment on. Aileen, would you ask that question yourself or make the point? She's still there, Aileen. 
Yeah, I'm here. I'm not sure what that is. Is that just that my mother got? Yes, correct. Oh yeah, my that um, the priest wanted to church my mother in the 1970s when myself and my sisters were born, um, which she refused, surprisingly enough, which is why I was interested in the whole churching thing, and I'd never realised that it was the Church of Ireland and it was so ancient, which was fascinating. So thanks a million for that, Fiona. I think that priest was out of sync, not only with what was happening politically, but also out of sync with uh, his own church. Quite possibly, mm. but he, he also didn't like to, to, he didn't want to baptise me using uh, uh, such a scandalous, scurrilous name as Aileen. So he kept trying to call me Mary. He did not go down well with his Aileen. <laughs> In the 1970s, sound like it was just yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> I'm only a baby, lads. <laughs> Uh, David Brown, was it common for a married woman to be buried with her paternal family rather than with her husband if she died without children? Um, oh, that's a little bit like a how long is a piece of string question. <laughs> right. um, a lot of that might come, a lot of that comes down to personal, to stated preference during someone's own lifetime. Um, I've heard anecdotally that where marriages were thought to be not very <clears throat> happy, that even where a married woman had children, she was buried with her own people rather than her husband's family. Um, and I've also seen families, I've seen burial records where a married woman had no surviving children, but was buried with her husband's family. So I really think that comes down to stated preference and also where the family were at the time of her death. I'm talking about emotionally where they were rather than physically where they yes, were. Yeah. Mm. Uh, in my family, sorry, Larry, if I can interrupt. In my family, can you hear, hear me? Yes, 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 go ahead. My, my great grandmother was buried with her parents. And two reasons, I think, for that. She died when my grandmother was about three. Um, the farm they lived on had belonged to her parents. It was the dowry that she brought when she married in the 1870s. And her husband was still young. And I think the view was he'll probably marry again, and want to be buried with his second wife, which is what duly happened. Um, and they brought her about eight miles to be buried with her parents when there was another graveyard two miles down the road, which would have been much closer. That was 1887. Okay. Uh, James is asked, are there still dioceses, Catholic in particular, that will not allow you to view the records unless you get permission from the bishop? Uh, Carrie seems to be in question. No, I think that whole thing has been blown out of the water after 2016, once the National Library published the records online, uh, 2015. Uh, once the records went up online, you couldn't really argue that anymore. Okay. Uh, uh, another one from Doran uh, Caffarel. I believe uh, my William Maloney name, um, sorry, my, I believe my William Maloney married a French Huguenot, uh, surname Noblet in County Limerick, wonder where their marriage might have been documented. Doran, I would start by looking for a marriage license bond. And that in a sense is making a huge presumption. I'm presuming that um, the family had money, but I would start by looking for a marriage license bond and I can't find it there. My next question is, was this uh, somebody who was French Huguenot a descendant of a French Huguenot or somebody who had, um, I suppose, retained their cultural identity as a Huguenot here in Ireland. The range of beliefs, some Huguenots conformed very quickly, others remain separate and become dissenters with the emergence of the Methodist Church, for example. So there's quite a range of beliefs there. Um, 
some of it comes down to how assimilated the Huguenot family were after a few generations. Okay. Uh, Doug is asking about which version of ancestry, UK or USA? Um, I have the international edition of ancestry. Um, I think that includes the US and the UK. Okay. Yes, I, I do likewise, international one. And that would cover everything. Uh, Gerald Real uh, is asking, watch out for transcription errors. Sometimes if you have an approximate year, it is useful to go directly to the manuscript church records on NLI website. You would concur with that? Uh, no, I usually stay in the same website. So I'll stay on Ancestry or I'll stay on Find My Past. And remember that an index is a man-made thing and it's made, it's a contemporary thing as well. So it's not made at the same time as the parish churches. Even so, it's very, very useful to have because it means that you can actually reach in and hopefully find what it is you're looking for. What I do do is I very often click directly to the registers and I will do what I call a fingertip search. And I literally will read, I did this earlier today, um, working for finding, finding your roots um, in the States. That's the PBS, Professor Henry Louis Gates. And we're looking for a family, I better not say what county, but um, I sat down and I read registers from 1840 to 1844, looking for a baptismal register earlier today. So is that what Jared means about going to the manuscript church records on the National Library website? I suppose it all happens within the frame of ancestry or find my past. So I don't think of it as actually yeah. yeah, Jared, do you, do you care to comment? Yeah, I'll just come in. Yeah, no, you're, you're right, Fiona. We're probably saying the same thing. What I mean is that sometimes the, the indexing isn't perfect. And if you just have to go to the manuscript, whether it's directly on the NLI website or whether you search around the manuscript and ancestry or find my past, I think yeah. I, mean, I mean the same thing. I like your phrase because I've done it myself. Uh, I like your phrase, a fingertip search, because I've, I've done that quite often. It's useful to... Yeah. You know, scan down to the registers, particularly if you're looking for um, more children in a family. By and large, unless children have died as infants, by and large, you'll find there's a child approximately every two years. Mm -hmm. You know, you can skim them down very quickly and, 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 and find, find more children in a family. So, so that's mm -hmm. what I mean, rather than just using the index directly all of the time. You, 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 you might be unlucky. Well, Jared, I think we're actually in agreement. Sorry, I'm so yeah, just yeah. you and I first. We are. Okay. Thank you. If there are no other questions, uh, I will draw to a close. Uh, Fiona, thank you for such a wonderful talk. And uh, you were extremely patient with all the questions and comments. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I just, yeah, I just closed by just mentioning that, that the next talk is on the 17th of February. And our speaker is Jim Hurley, and it's about tracing your Irish police ancestors. I think it's going to be uh, fairly broad, but uh, we're looking forward to that talk, and that's on the 17th of February. Uh, we have still, we mentioned last, last month or in December, we have three books that were on sale. One, in fact, is no longer available. It's the Old Mill Street. The remaining two are the military barracks, the old military barracks by William Crowley and uh, Jane's own Clooney graveyard uh, transcriptions. Uh, so those are still available in some numbers, but uh, I wouldn't delay in getting your copy, okay? They can be got from the Ennis Book Shop in here in Ennis, the O'Connell Shop in Upper Market and uh, Mary Kelly's New Day News Agent in O'Connell Street. Uh, the recording itself, I mentioned, will be up shortly. Uh, we're all going to be having to go back and look at that because there was so much information in this, this talk. And it just leads me to sign off and thank everyone for attending. Especially, uh, uh, I want to thank Eric for helping tonight. He was in the background, but he was very helpful, I can assure you. And above all, special thanks to Fiona for such a great talk. 
and uh, given use of our time. By the way, Fiona, this is not your first time speaking with Claire people. I believe you attended the conference and spoke uh, in 2013. I did, and I also gave talks to Claire Roots, was it 2008 or 2009? Oh, that's before my uh, time. Okay, <laughs> a long time back. <laughs> Oh, uh, right. Thank you to everyone for asking me, and thank you to Larry and Eric, and to Jane, and I hope Jane is feeling better soon. All right. Look, everyone, have a good night, and uh, and stay safe, uh, and keep well, all right? And we'll see you hopefully next, next month. Please, God. All right. Good night now, everyone. Good night. Good night.